on the show to review this and all the developments is uh, a youth advocate and a public affairs analyst, Comrade Richard Romanos. Good morning to you. Good morning, Vito, and good to be here again. Now, before we get into all the news developments, having listened to Mr. Fashola make his points, uh, do you see reasons why Labour needs to still sit down and understand that a large demographic of Nigerians are not under the employment of the federal or state civil service? And this artisans, unskilled laborers who earn wages, like we're talking about, might not be covered by the demands for a living wage, which is referred to what the workers should be earning as salaries. Well, I think that um, uh, former Governor Fashola is at the, the conversation, the, yeah, the conversation the former governor is uh, bringing to this discourse is very, very important. Uh, sincerely, up to this time, you know, I haven't thought in this um, direction until uh, I was listening to him. You know, it is important that um, this um, segment uh, of uh, the people, you know, are captured in whatever um, the Nigerian Labour People uh, Congress are requesting for. You know, um, whether we like it or not, we must take this set of people into cognizance. You know, the skilled, whether you are skilled, whether you are unskilled. You know, it is important that um, uh, whatsoever the Labour, Nigerian Labour Congress is, uh, uh, you, uh, this thing, Nigerian Labour Congress are doing, you know, they take them into, into cognizance. And, I mean, like he has said, you know, it is imp uh, for the... The onus now lies on the National Assembly too, you know, to also um, fast track uh, all of this so that everybody, everybody, you know, whether they skilled, whether they skilled, you know, is um, captured in the entire uh, uh, process. Now, no more developments greeting this discussion while the National Assembly awaits the bill is on the stands of organized labor under the umbrella of the nlc and tuc and it makes coverage on our next two papers the matrix and the blueprints of those two papers this morning there's a report of a u-turn on the part of organized labor let's begin with the matrix as lead story beneath the masthead you'd find 250k new minimum wage labor makes u-turn 250k new minimum wage labor makes u-turn no figure is sacrosanct. There's room for adjustments, says Labour. Says we will approach the National Assembly for more. If states should determine what they can pay comfortably, says ex-governor. Now we would find uh, more developments here on the blueprint with the catchphrase minimum wage. Nigerians in fear as Labour refuses to shift gaze. Now, and it's also on the role the media has played in shaping perspective. You, you see two papers now. While the matrix is saying that Labour is using is looking to make a U-turn, no figure is sacrosanct. The blueprint is reporting it as Labour refusing to shift gaze. <laughs> Do you think that the media has also somewhat played a role in the way Nigerians have perceived the efforts made by the current administration and the National Assembly in fine-tuning negotiations? <laughs> well, again, whether you like it or not, these guys want to also sell their papers. You know, <laughs> if you if you go in if you go into details of most of these papers, you will discover that uh, what the headline is saying is almost different from um, what the real the content of that. Uh, Headlines the, or the story is saying, you know, but be it as it may, you know, I also think that um, it is important that um, labor actually shift grounds. You know, the last time I was here, I told you that there was need for both the federal government and the Nigerian Labor Congress to meet themselves somewhere. You know, if if both if both parties, you know, are able to shift grounds, I think that um, uh, in no, in no time, you know, all of this will be uh, resolved. Now, it's also on the part of state governors. Under the Nigerian Governors Forum, a, a, a majority of them have come out to say 57,000 is what will be feasible. They can't spend the entire federal allocation paying salaries. Now, we're also beginning to see governors in their respective states make individual statements. The other day, it was uh, Governor Soludo who said that... Uh, the political class might also begin to contemplate taking a minimum wage. Now, before you make your thoughts, just hold your thoughts. 
let's also listen to governor sani who says that he's been receiving half of his salary ever since he came into office then we'll come back to take his thoughts and yours as well on the show take a listen when we came in we sat down with them and i said look charity begins at home we have to court the cost of governance in kaduna state i told them look we are only a state where at least 60 percent of the population of Kaduna state are living below the poverty line i said the deputy governor can we now reduce this analysis because it's too much they all agree collectively even myself they need to cut my salary into two so today i'm receiving half salary since i became governor of Kaduna state Commissioners, advisors, senior special assistants, since we came in, we removed the performance bonus. When you put all this money together, that is why people are surprised. We are doing some works. It's because you have to court the cost of governance. And today, no commissioner in community, not even deputy governor, is using a new car. I told them the cars we inherited from previous commissioners, let's use it. Today, I'm using my personal cars as a governor. So that's what we've been doing. It's not magic. It's cutting. Now, talking about cutting the cost of governance would always refer to the recommendations of the Stephen Orusayan report. But now we have in Kaduna State, Governor Sani Uba talking about himself as a person receiving half his pay. No commissioner within his cabinet has gotten any new cars. Uh, do you think that this should be a template whilst we're looking to debate? what can be affordable state governors should be seen to also lead by example much like governor sanuba again like i said the last time i was here i told you that um uh politicians too must take it easy with um with us the electorate you know uh all of us everybody wants to live the good life you know Everybody wants to drive in Porsche cars, you know. And um, if we all make individual sacrifices, if these politicians are also seen to be making personal sacrifices for everybody, I think that um, uh, most of the issues we are having, you know, will not be there. And I'd like to commend Governor Obasani for for if indeed what he has said you know is actually what is uh, uh, applicable you know there is need for us generally for there is need for people generally to actually cut uh, 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 um, uh, the cost of governance cut the cost of governance you know just like he has done you know if his people if the people of uh, Kaduna see clearly that this is the sacrifices our governor is doing just to make our lives better. Tell me why they were not supporting. Tell me why the Labour Nigeria Labour Congress uh, Kaduna State Chapter will not support um, uh, Governor Obasani. You know, and I think that his counterparts in other states, you know, should also um, should also uh, borrow a lift from him. You know. <laughs> we see state governors driving over 10 cars, 11, 15 cars in their convoys. Most of these cars are empty. You know, what are we doing with all of this type of this, all of these cars, especially when you're driving within your state? You know, why can't you have one car, one backup, your security and all of that? Why do you, why do you need to, who are inside those cars? You know. There is need for these people to actually cut costs, you know, just so that, you know, most of these monies they spent in some of these frivolities can be committed into something else. Now, in keeping with the demands of organized labor as it regards the new minimum wage negotiations, it is also on the National Assembly in terms of the prospects of Nigerians. Now, the Guardian newspaper looks at it from that angle of a legislative duty owed to Nigerians. The lead story beneath the masthead on The Guardian this morning reads, Suspense as employers, workers, await transmission of minimum wage bill to NAS. Suspense as employers, workers, await transmission of minimum wage bill to NAS. 
Now you have uh, boldly pictured beneath that a picture of the National Assembly with uh, the president of the NLC, Comrade Joe Ajero, and the president of the TUC, Comrade Festus Osifo, both pictured there. There's a quote beneath that. I'll just take a quick read at that quote. It says, and I quote, The first consideration in wage negotiation is affordability and ability to pay. Can states, local government councils, and private sectors, employers afford to pay? And what are the consequences on the economy? Inflationary trend and possible layoff of workers. If the NLC and TUC blackmail the government to agree on a minimum wage that is not realistic and sustainable. Unquote. Now, this is one part that I don't think has been highlighted a lot. What would happen if most local government councils, private employers and states cannot afford to pay whatever wage bill is agreed upon? There would be massive layoff of workers further pushing our unemployment statistics to the roof. Again, like I said, if you recall the last time I was here, I I also raised this concern. You know, the concern of the concern of let's even assume that the federal government agrees to uh, agrees to the request by the Nigerian Labour Congress. You know, what happens to the private sector? Can they be able to afford this? Um, uh, uh, what it, can they be? Can they be able to afford some of these demands? You know, and what about what about job sec the job security? <laughs> are you sure it's going to be guaranteed? You know, I mean, we are talking about unemployment rate in Nigeria. You know, the moment the private sectors too cannot be able to afford what is uh, what is. Um, what is being demanded, you know, by their employees, they begin to lay off some in order to be able to meet uh, the agreed um, uh, uh, wage, 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 wage bill, you know. So what happens to those that will be laid off or that would have been laid off, you know. That is why my stance, as always, is that both NLC and the government must must shift ground. If they shift ground, the federal government shift ground, shift ground, the Nigerian Liberal Congress shift ground, and meet themselves in um, a certain place, you know, I am sure that both parties would be happy. And the private sectors too, Nigerians generally too, would be happy. Now, the National Assembly would be the people's representation in this debate. And under the leadership of the President of the Senate, Senator Gosu Lakbabio, a man who, even at the local government level, had been in a seat of leadership at the state level, even as a commissioner, even as a governor, and now the president of the Senate. Someone with that wealth of experience having dealt with workers at different cadre. Are you well satisfied that the National Assembly under his leadership would find an appealing living wage that Nigerians would be well pleased in their decision. Gosu Akwabi has always been um, one politician with the human face, actually. You know, I have followed his politics right from when he was uh, the governor. You know, I shouldn't say when he was commissioner, but I can tell you that I have also followed his, I followed his politics right from that time, you know. And you will agree with me that the policies he formulated as governor you know, where people centered policies, you know, God's will like has always been a people's person, you know, and I have no doubt at all that whatever he will do, you know, as uh, the leader of the National Assembly, you know, as the chairman of the National Assembly, I am very sure that will be in, um, uh, in alignment with what the people want now uh, let's digress a bit there's also been an expanded engagement across party lines you talked about the much needed developmental strides recorded as his, as, as when he was governor of Akwaibum state now the current leadership in Akwaibum state under governor umweno is not with the apc it's with the pdp but notwithstanding we've seen some sort of camaraderie between the governor and the Senate president. 
looking at some of the infrastructures he left on ground, the Gosu Lakbabe Stadium that is now uh, classified as one of the FIFA approved and only one in Nigeria. We've seen his visit to the executive chambers and now a return visit of His Excellency the Governor, Pastor Moeno, to the residents of the Senate President in Abuja over the course of the weekend view. Uh, how do you see this as people continue to call for a government of unity? Do you think this is one of the good examples of a government of national unity? Well, Bito, the truth is, I I like what is happening in Akwa Ibom State. Actually, you know, I I have not hidden my excitement about some of the things I see almost on a daily basis from Akwa Ibom, especially from. Governor Moeno. You know, it has always been my opinion that um, we've had too many good politicians in the saddle. We have had too many good politicians occupy one political office to the other. I think we should take a break from having good politicians to having good men. You know, by good men, I mean people who are compassionate, people with love for humanity and all of that. If you have good men in offices, just like I will describe Governor Moino to be a good man, you know, you discover that the things he's doing are the things you see replicated in other states, you know, where good men are on the saddle. Take for example, this governor has taken it upon himself <laughs> to reconcile virtually everybody in Afaibo State. Who would have believed that Governor Moino will have anything to do with um, Goswil Akpabi, Senator Goswil Akpabi? It is on record, or we all know how he, how he became governor. Who made him governor? We will all say the immediate past governor, uh, uh, the Kenam... Gabriel Ludom, you know, was he's the major person that uh, brought him to power, you know. But how he has been able to sustain his relationship with his, his predecessor and the Senate president, who is also his predecessor, you know, should be studied. And if you look at the picture, you see right on the of your look in the picture. Who was, also know, who was also a protege of governor of senator or who is also because tomorrow right on the of your glue considers Gosu Lakpabio, Senator Gosu Lakpabio as his as, as his mentor. You know. So I think that the relationship I am seeing, you know, is one that will bring development, is one that will bring um, rapid growth, you know, for the people of Akpabio State. And lastly, if you look at what is happening in Akpai Bum State, it is not the thing of um, government is a continuum by mouth. It is actually what is happening in Akpai Bum State. You know, every governor continues exactly from where the other stops. You know, you can hardly find an abandoned project in Akpai Bum State. Tell me how such a state will not develop. So I think that other states should borrow a lift from what is happening in a Bum state. Look at that picture again. He discovered that uh, that is a mixture of both PDP and APC. And APC. And APC in that picture. Is that the same thing happening in Benue State? Not at all. Is that the same thing happening in River State? So people should borrow a lift from what is happening in that state. Now, now this government of national unity we keep talking about uh, people at the state level find it difficult to comprehend. There's always that perceived rivalry among political parties. When the 10th National Assembly, you, you find whenever the Senate President is on oversight function, this is the National Assembly with the most representation in terms of political parties. You almost cannot tell who is Labour Party, who is PDP, who is APC, in the way they go about their oversight. Again, Bito, um... By the grace of God, I was one young man who before so many people would even think that Gosu Lakpabio, Senate Pre Senator Gosu Lakpabio should be Senate President, 
would be the Senate president. I was one young man who took it upon myself to start campaign for his Senate presidency. I went all the way to AIT to canvass reasons why Senator Goswila Pabio should be Senate president. And like I said, Senator Goswila Pabio, if you follow his politics right from when he was governor, there is absolutely no reason why you shouldn't support this man. You know, the man is that man that carries everybody along. So I, I am not surprised with what is happening in the 10th Senate. And like you rightly said, under Goswila like Pabio, you just can hardly tell who is Labour Party, who is PDP, who is APC. You know, all of these parties are all manning very juicy committees. And this is a clear departure from what used to be. You know, this is a clear departure from what used to be. If you see the maturity, Senator Gossel Akpabio is, um, is um, uh, exhibiting, you know, in managing the affairs of the Senate. You know, he discovered that there wouldn't have been any better person other than him for the choice of a Senate president. Now, the current leadership of the National Assembly has also marked its first year in office. Now, we've seen a large activity of oversight functions beyond bills being proposed this National Assembly has been one to very readily interact with the constituency as it should be. Uh, how would you score their performance in the last one year? Uh, this National Assembly has done well. It has done well. I cannot find them wanting in any way. You know, I cannot find them wanting in any way. I take my state, for example. All three senators from Cross River North, talking about Senator Jerry Beagom, Senator Ethan Williams, Senator Asukwe Kweyong, all of them are doing creditably well. If you go to Cross River South, who Asukwe Kweyong would have been termed as a newbie, you know, in the legislature, you know, but go to Cross River South and see what he's doing. You wouldn't believe that this is just one man who was just um who just clocked one year as a legislator or as a, as a federal legislator you know you see his programs and project you know spread across the seven local government area that make to, makes up his um senatorial district the same thing is obtainable in um crossover central senatorial district you know and then not to talk of not and this is almost the same thing with the members representing um, the members in the Green Chambers too, you know. So for me, judging by what my um, uh, the National Assembly members in Cross River State are doing, I mean, the 